Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, welcome to the course on bioreactor design and analysis. So I will be uh, giving you an introduction about the course today. We will be talking about what will be the things which we will be uncovering in this course. So the topics which we are going to cover in this course include design of patch reactors, then continuous reactors design of fed patch reactors and mass transfer operations which take place in bioreactors. Then we will go on to study the heat transfer operations in bioreactors, scale up of bioprocesses and then we will end up with the some introduction on the non-ideality of bioreactors and how to handle it in practical situations. These are some textbooks for your reference. You can go through it after the lecture. So as you can see on the slides, uh, the title of the slide is bioreactors. It is important to know what is a bioreactor. So in uh, fermentation industry or biotechnology based industries, bioreactors play a crucial role. I would rather say they are a foundation stone for these industries. Now what are bioreactors? You can call them as devices in which a substrate which is of low value is utilized by living cells or the cellular components which we call as biocatalyst named as enzymes to generate a product of higher value. So inside this device which we call as bioreactors there are different kinds of production platforms which are used to convert a low cost substrate to a high cost product. Now the different production platforms which are used in industry, they vary greatly. You will hear about plant cells being used, you will hear about microorganisms, then there are animal cells which are used in industry. And also rather than using the whole cells, industries are also using cellular components or to say biocatalyst which are like chemical enzymes responsible for carrying out desirable bioreactions. These due to a series of reactions, so when whole cells are used, they undergo a series of reactions which are called as metabolic reactions as a result of which the substrate is converted into product. Mostly these substrates are compounds which are required for the growth and survival of the organism. And due to its metabolic reactions or metabolism to say, the end products of this metabolism can be of high value to us which we call them as products. Then apart from bioconversion reactions other than the metabolic reactions, there are also a set of reactions which these biocatalysts or enzymes, they carry out like for example detoxification reactions, reactions which may be needed to convert a toxic metabolite into a non-toxic form. So sometimes such reactions can also be converting a low cost product into a high cost product. So they come under biotransformation where the substrate when exposed to either repository of enzymes which we call as whole cells or single enzymes or free enzymes can convert these substrates through a series of reactions by which there is some chemical transformation done in the compound so as to convert it into a desirable form which we call as product. Now there are third set of products which can also be achieved in bioreactors. 
which we call as recombinant products. Now recombinant products, they are a result of certain reactions which are not present in the native organism. So to say which are not inherent to the native organism, but the organism has been engineered deliberately to carry out those set of reactions, which we call as genetic engineering. So when a substrate is exposed to the organism, the organism uses the substrates and the substrates undergoes a series of reactions which are not inherent to the organism's metabolism, but is operational due to the genetic intervention done inside the organism and results into a high value products. So those are called as recombinant products. So now I hope you are able to see the wide array of kind of products which these bioreactors can produce. Let's see our day to day products in our life which we use. Let's talk about bread or biscuits which have been fortified to have rich nutrients or personal care products like cream, cosmetics or detergents, textile detergents which we use day to day to wash our clothes or paper, tissue which we frequently use then carpets or furnitures, polyesters, in fact even rubber, then biofuels which I am sure you must have heard of as an alternate to conventional fuel, plastics. Now plastic has a wide array of applications in our life ranging from food service ware to beverage packaging, food packaging, plastic containers and so on. Now all these products were conventionally produced via chemical reactions but then gradually advancement in the biotechnology industry these products are now being produced as a result of biotechnology driven processes by biotechnology industries. Let's see why this change has happened. And these are some of the examples which will tell you how biotechnology intervention has been useful to humankind. Like for example, let's take bread. Now in bread, conventionally a chemical which is known to be carcinogen, potassium bromate used to be used as a preservative for dose strengthening. Now, there are some industries which are now using genetically enhanced microorganisms to produce different flavors of breads and with better quality in terms of strengthened dough, higher shelf life and high quality. Now in terms of environment sustainability, the process has become more environment friendly because a large reduction in the release of greenhouse gas and the biotechnological process is of advantage because it is able to avoid the use of the carcinogen potassium bromate. Let's talk about the cosmetics or personal care products where generally like your petroleum jelly where generally products based on petroleum distillates they are used in the market. Now this process itself leads to a large amount of release of greenhouse gases. So biotechnologically driven processes like for example genetically modified microbes they produce 1,3 propane diol from renewable feedstocks which can then be used as humectants or emollient or hand feel modifier. Now these processes in general they lead to a very high reduction in greenhouse gas emissions up to 50% in some cases and it also leads to reduction of harsh conditions or moderate conditions are used in comparison to chemical processes in terms of the requirements of pH temperature. Some more examples like for example your detergent, textile or papers where 
bleaching agents are used like hydrogen peroxide chlorine which can cause harm to the environment when released or sometimes in pulp industry acid is used harsh chemicals are used so now with biotechnology intervention there are certain microbes which can produce a set of enzymes ranging from being proteases lipases amylases which have the capability of degrading different types of strains or cellulases which have the capability of degrading the cellulose and making it easier to for processing of pulp in the paper industry now again the result is that there is a large decrease in the release of greenhouse gases you can avoid the use of bleaching agents chemical bleaches less harsh conditions are used in the to carry out these processes and the product quality is enhanced now talking about the use of polymers now nylon which is a well known polymer and has a very frequent use in our lives can also be produced via genetically modified organisms which produce 13 propane diol which forms the building block of nylon then polyols which can replace polyurethane foams now they can be produced using renewable feed stocks from certain microorganisms which can then be chemically mixed with other ingredients to create flexible foams for use all these processes again lead to up to 60% reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions or the use of renewable energy and the durability the environmental friendliness like the biodegradability is an added advantage the well known biofuels where ethanol is conventionally produced by acid hydrolysis of starch can now be produced via biotechnology using enzymatic hydrolysis of starch and cellulose thereby reducing the use of chemicals and energy or toxic byproducts release and also fewer release of greenhouse gases talking about the use of plastics now plastics as we know it has become a menace in the world now people have been trying to invent bioplastics to replace the chemically originated plastics now these bioplastics are nothing but polymers produced by the microorganisms as a result of their metabolism so bacillus for example a microbe which can ferment corn sugar to lactic acid which is heated to create the biodegradable polymer so like polylactic acid is one of the key polymers which is used in packaging industry has a use in food service ware making or food packaging so it can replace the conventional plastic or polyhydroxy alkanoates which are produced by certain bacteria as carbon reserves these polymers can in turn be used to replace the conventional plastics the advantage being that bioplastics are completely biodegradable in nature so they are environment friendly substitute to plastics there is lesser greenhouse gas emissions up to 50% reduction is observed and less energy requirements in the process because of moderate conditions under which biochemical reactions take place so these were some of the examples where biotechnology has played a key role in substituting certain harmful chemical reactions for commercial use now let's see what are the advantages after looking at these examples which i talked about i am sure you must have got an idea of the various advantages which biotechnology or biochemical reactions have over the chemical reactions now how biotechnology can be better than chemical synthesis as you can see on the slide biochemical reactions they can be carried out under milder 
process conditions. So they become more energy efficient and more cost effective. Being driven by biocatalysts called enzymes, they have higher regio and stereo selectivity. So that's a very big advantage. Like for example, I'll give you an example of alpha tocopherol. Alpha tocopherol, which is the most bioactive component of vitamin E, can be extracted from plant tissues. It is chemically also produced. However, chemically produced has a racemic mixture, results in a racemic mixture where in nature, due to the metabolism in the plant, the one particular isomeric form is the most bioactive and is the one which is preferentially adsorbed by the human body and is useful to us. So that's one example where if a natural reaction or a biological reaction is carried out, it can result in desirably producing the right isomer of the product. However, in chemical reactions, there is less control over the kind of isomer which can be obtained. Now, biotechnology driven processes are more sustainable in nature because they mostly use renewable resources as raw materials or as substrates like for example, cellulose, starch, sucrose, peanut meal, and many others. Biochemical reactions, they are also amenable to optimizations, which means there is a scope to improve the product yield via changing the process conditions and being controlled reactions. In biologically driven reactions, there are less toxic byproducts release in comparison to chemically driven reactions. And they are found to be more environmental friendly, as I told you during giving the examples where up to 50 to 60 percent reduction has been observed in the greenhouse gas emissions when chemically driven processes were replaced by the biologically driven processes. Let's see what is a typical bioprocess. Now this is a schematic which talks about what are the different steps involved to convert a low cost substrate to a high cost product. So in a typical bioprocess, if you see on the left hand side top corner is the stock culture. Stock culture means your master cell bank, which can be cryopreserved or maintained for its continuous use in the production. So that stock culture is brought to a working culture state where it is called as working cell bank by exposing it to favorable nutrients or rich nutrients at a very small scale, which is generally shake flask level. Now the shake flask level, you can optimize the medium composition to find out the right medium nutrients for maximum product formation. And shake flask studies are also used for screening of cell lines of finding the highest yielding cell line. So from the stock culture, you make it into a working stock by bringing it to a shake flask level. Now from the shake flask, you bring it to the, you prepare the inoculum, which is called as the starter culture for the production scale. Now this is called as the seed fermenter. This is a small size reactor where you will mass multiply the starter culture to bring it at a stage where it is ready to be inoculated in the production fermenter. Then on the right hand side top corner, there is raw material, which is your substrate. Sometimes the raw material is required to be pre-treated or processed before it can be used in the reactor. So that raw material is processed, then medium formulation is done where the media which involves macronutrients, micronutrients and depending on the production platforms, there might be a need for other compounds like hormones or growth promoting substances for the organism. Now, the key is that bioreactor is a controlled system in which only monoseptic operations can be done. 
So in order to enable monoseptic culture, the media with the substrate has to be sterilized, which means it has to get rid of any contaminant or any other microorganism which can contaminate the production fermenter. So there are different ways in which sterilization can be done. So this sterilization is also one of the key steps in fermentation technology. After the sterilization is completed, the sterile medium with the substrate is then fed into the production fermenter and the production fermenter is inoculated with the starter culture from the seed fermenter. Now this fermenter will have different key parts where there is if it is an aerobic fermentation which means the organism if it needs oxygen for its growth then there are parts in the reactors which will facilitate oxygen transfer to these organisms. This will include sparging device, there will be a mixing device which we call as impellers to create a homogeneous environment inside the reactor. So this is the portion where various heat transfer operations, mass transfer operations are carried out in order to enhance your biological rate of reactions or to optimize the biological rate of reaction. Then this reactor is also under computer aided control of a biocontroller where there is an automated control of the process conditions. Now because these are biologically driven reactions, they work best at certain set of conditions, can be physical and chemical. So in order to maintain those required set of conditions at their optimum values to maximize the productivity or the production rates, there is an automated control which can help in maintaining the culture conditions of this controlled system environment at its optimum. Generally you will find there is pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, these are the key parameters which can be controlled in a reactor. There is a sparging device through which air can be continuously sparged in inside the reactor to make oxygen available for growth of the organism. Then below the reactor, the steps involved, they come under downstream processing which involve the recovery of the product which may involve separation of the product from the biomass. Now if the product is extracellular then the cell need not be disrupted and the product has to be separated from the broth. Otherwise if it is intracellular then first the biomass has to be harvested which means separated from the liquid broth spent medium and then the biomass has to be separately disrupted to bring out the product which comes under product recovery. Then comes product purification which also involves concentration of the product to have higher concentrations of the product. So where you remove the other byproducts or undesired products from the liquid broth. Then whatever is the spent medium remaining cannot be released in the environment as such. So it is treated and brought under the safe limits before the release into the environment as waste streams. So this entire process comes under effluent treatment which is a must for most of the process industries. So this entire schematic is responsible while converting a substrate of low value getting utilized by the living cells to produce a product of high value. Now the questions which are required to be answered for running a bioprocess efficiently involve questions like how fast will the process take place which includes investigating the reaction kinetics. Then what changes can one expect to occur during this process which includes investigating the metabolic state or the physiological state of the cell which is being cultivated inside the reactor. 
one should know how can this system be operated and controlled for the maximum yield and productivity, be it in terms of biomass or in terms of product. So this step is where reactor design plays a crucial role. This also involves instrumentation and control, but here we are going to focus in this course on the reactor design aspect. What do we mean by reactor design? When we need to ensure that the system is operated and controlled to achieve maximum productivity. And then there is one more question, which is how can the product be then separated once achieved for maximum purity and in minimum cost? So this is a different set of study, which comes under downstream processing, which is another course in itself, where different ways in which the product is separated and purified are discussed. So to say, what is an efficient bioprocess? It depends on the following things. One, on the production of the organism inside the reactor, how well the organism is getting mass multiplied, which means maximizing the biomass which is achieved. What conditions are required to obtain the desired product formation? See, being metabolic reactions, there can be more than one products getting formed simultaneously. So what process conditions should be applied so as to drive the carbon flux desirably towards your desired product? Then the value of the product and the scale of operation, which means at what scale you should run the process to keep it cost effective and to meet the market demand. So these are some of the questions which are dealt with in bioreactor design and analysis as well. Now, in what sense? Like for example, in order to answer these questions, you should be able to know what size of reactor is needed to run the operation what type of reactor you will be needing and what method of operation will be best for the given substrate duty or conversion. So the points which we will consider in bioreactor design, they should be able to control and positively influence the biological reaction that is key. It should be able to prevent contamination the bioreactor design should be such that the capital investment can be kept as low as possible and similarly the operational cost and one has to take care that in the chosen reactor design it facilitates maintenance of monoseptic conditions during the entire fermentation period. Depending on the production platforms being used the fermentation time can vary from hours to days and even sometimes to months. So the chosen reactor design should therefore also look into factors like optimal mixing, optimal heat transfer and with low and uniform shear requirements for maximum viability of the culture to achieve maximum productivity.